your video is off now. Uh, OK, um, anyway, so how have you been? Have you started your draft personal statement? Uh, have been. OK, um, um, what have you been up to? Just revising for a level? Yeah, chemistry physics. OK, okay. Um, uh, what was I going to ask you? Um, OK, uh, anyway, I was going to discuss a little bit about your personal statement, but um, let me just ask some general question. Do you know why you're applying for chemistry at Oxford? Sorry? Do you know, do you have any idea why you're applying for chemistry at Oxford? Why are you applying for chemistry? Uh, if you uh, ask that question. I'm interested in environmental chemistry or something. Basically, I'm interested in making products more environmental friendly and stuff like that. Is that all? Uh, like, uh, you see, like you, you need to be prepared to be asked this kind of thing. Although in general, like the interview is very academic. You need to have an idea, otherwise you will already find it difficult or, or your personal statement will just be quite boring and generic. Um, how about if they throw a question at you? Like, um, why, why did you decide to apply for this course at Oxford specifically? Okay, these are things you need to think about, yeah? Um, what are your plans um, after you finish this course, for example? Like, what, what, what do you see yourself achieving uh, after you finish this course? What do you want to do after you finish this course? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> no? Yeah. Okay, cool. So it's not, it's not all about... Um, just a result and thing, yeah? So it's okay to have no plan, but at least you should have some idea of what you want to do. An idea does not mean that you will necessarily do it, um, okay? And um, yeah, a lot of the times they are looking for ambitious people and um, people with clear set goals and ambitions, okay? Because I they think such people would be very driven because they know what they want and therefore you will be confident talking about it rather than uh, actually, I'm not sure. If you're unsure about everything, it makes you uncertain, just like college choices and things, yeah? Okay, actually, before we start talking a little bit of, uh, we'll do a little bit of organic camp this week, yeah? Uh, okay. So, so without inorganic, we've done the maths, um, we'll move on to organic camp. Um, what, what branch of chemistry do you like the best? Organic, yeah. Oh, organic. so you would say organic is your strongest area then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, tell me what kind of what kind what kind of <coughs> organic chemistry area do you like? You know, like the stuff that you've done in school. What what kind about what about organic chem do you like? Uh, how in depth uh, you can go? Like uh, benzene chemistry, I love that because it's there's a lot of um, ideas going on from other parts of chemistry. Such and as? Like, um, the localized P bonds. Uh, Sorry, say that again? The localized P bonding. Uh, what do you mean by P bonding? Uh, the, or the P orbitals are overlap sideways. That's and... called pi bonds. <laughs> it's not a P bond, it's a pi bond. <laughs> um, Oh, okay. Anyway, um, as long as you know, it's because uh, when you when you say P, I don't know whether you refer to PI itself or whether you refer to the alphabet P itself, which is the, the P orbital being involved. So, okay, it's a pi bond. Anyway, go on. Uh, organic. Anything else? Uh, our mechanism is fun because okay. it can relate to um, real life situations like poor donate. Um, rich don't need poor. Sorry, say that again. You can relate to like real life situations, like uh -huh. donating to the poor can be an analogy to electrophilic substitution. Okay. Okay. Um. So tell me about um some you know like what what is your favorite organic mechanism that you have done so far in school? In school, uh. 
like which 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 type of mechanism fascinate you the most? You got so many to choose from, is it? <laughs> you can you can throw me a couple of examples. Anything you want to talk about? Uh, Esther mechanism is quite fun. Sorry, say that again. Esther mechanism. Oh, okay. Do you mean Esther hydrolysis or Esther formation mechanism? Esther, Esther formation. Oh, okay, so if you say ester formation uh, mechanism is quite fun, do you mind just just using an example or, or two of your own, like just sh sh drawing and guiding me through your drawing and show me, show me, you know, get me through your mechanism and explain it. Okay. I don't think you should leave the interviewer uh, being so quiet. You should, you should again, you know, thinking aloud. Uh, okay. Keep on talking. Okay, keep on talking. Okay. What you are doing? I'm a. Uh, I use ethanoic acid and uh, ethanol with H plus catalyst. So the alcohol acts as a nucleophile in this case, and then. It attacks the carbonyl carbon, the lone pair on the oxygen for ethanol. And then, and then a proton exchange occurs. A pro, yeah, proton transfer. So the carbon. The OH group from the carboxylic acid becomes H2O, which is a leaving group. And then... The bond breaks by heterolytic fusion to form... Water. And then the lone pairs in, in the oxygen goes to donate an electron towards a single bond to become a double bond. Have you got a mechanism there? Okay. Mm, okay. So using methanol instead of ethanol. I, I thought you mentioned ethanol just now, but anyway, that's fine. Um, something is wrong with your second step. Uh, your your first step, basically your second compound. There. Can you see what's wrong with it? So the product of the first step. Can you see what's wrong with it? So the, the nucleophile attacks the carbon now, yeah, okay, and then it forms that, that thing there. So when the oxygen acts as a nucleophile and it forms that bond to the carbon, uh, how many bonds does that oxygen have now in the product? Three. Uh, so it has a... So you already forgot the basic thing about uh, charges, yeah? So these are conservation charges. So you started with something neutral, neutral, and then there's a H plus that you pick up. Therefore, your resulting from that will be a plus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, show me again. I need to see your other thing. Um, so that thing is there. And then 
Yeah. So, so essentially there is a H plus. So basically now because you 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 miss the you miss the plus on the oxygen just now, right? So your your can you take the photo down again? So your next step is actually uh your next step is actually the proton transfer onto the one of those OH they are neutral and it become it become H two O and then with a plus but still bond to the carbon. And because it's a H2O plus now, again, it become a good living group on its own. And therefore this induced the the one, the oxygen to use its lone pair to, to donate back and form that uh, strong C double bond or and kick out the good living group again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So everything falls into play there. Did you say that um it kicks out water? It forms water as well, right? Because give out give out the H2O as a living group in this case, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you say you use uh, one one acid as a catalyst? What, what kind of acid you use as a catalyst? Uh, sulfuric acid. Okay. Is, do you know Do you know why the sulfuric acid is acting as a catalyst here? It produces uh, back the H plus. Yeah, but but uh, why is it acting as a catalyst here? How come? <laughs> How come how come we use corn sulfur acid? How come we don't use corn hydrochloric acid, for example? Or corn phosphoric? Is it why why must it be corn sulfuric? Do you know anything about this? Uh no. Do you mind suggesting why? Um... So what 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 do you know about concentrated sulfur acid? Tell me what do you know about concentrated sulfur acid? It's it is a giant agent. It's what what do you mean is a drying agent? What does it do? It removes water. Oh, so it's a dehydrating agent. Okay, not just a drying agent, because you can dry anything. You can dry ammonia. You can dry whatever. When you dry ammonia, it's not acting as a dehydrating agent. It's acting as a neutralizing agent or drying, which is why you, you, you can't collect ammonia by using corn sulfur as a as a as a dehydrating agent. Because ammonia ammonia likes to bond with water, right? Because of hydrogen bond. So if yeah. you want to get pure dry ammonia, you need to dry it. You need to remove the water, but you can't use things like corn sulfur to to dry ammonia, simply because as a best reaction, you just end up getting like white powder coming off, which is a salt. Anyway, cool. So you think it's a you know it's a dehydrating agent. So you are producing water here, right? So yeah. so in light of this knowledge, what what else do you think the corn sulfur acid do in this reaction? It allows the methanol nucleophile to attack the carbonyl carbon because then the carbon, the double bond can become a single bond. Oh, well, there's the part where it's acting as a strong acid, right? Okay, but we are talking about, um, uh, okay, let's talk about that first. So the role of corn sulfur acid as an acid is an acid catalyst in this esterification reaction. It's also acting as a catalyst in the in the reverse reaction, which is hydrolysis. So think about this idea. The fact that you can form ester, you can also hydrolyze ester, right? So so when you use corn sulfuric acid in this case, and then you are you are reacting ethanol acid and, and methanol to give you this uh, methyl ethanol ester. So so the corn sulfuric acid is still present in there because it's a catalyst, it's not used up, right? Okay. So what makes you think that you get the product and how come the corn sulfur acid which is still present in that solution mixture how come it doesn't hydrolyze the product back to the reactant do you get the question yeah so you have, you have the pot you have the pot which has the ethanol acid and methanol and then you chuck in some corn sulfur acid and then you reflux it and then the fact that you know it's a it's a, acting as an acid catalyst it's not used up you still get the same amount of corn sulfur acid at the end than, than when you started. And you say you, you get this product ester. But again, I want you to think about the, the, the reactants and the condition you use for ester hydrolysis. It's also using acid and heat. Yeah. So, 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 so how do you see that happening? Like, like what, 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 are you, what can you comment on that? Yeah, that should form an equilibrium mixture then. Ah, okay. So, so you're talking about equilibrium now. So they're actually existing in the equilibrium uh, uh, mixture, right? So, so you won't get hundred percent of the product. 
So because it's the equilibrium, that means you can favor one side of the equilibrium or the other. You won't favor it totally, but you can try to push the equilibrium to one side or the other simply by changing certain conditions, right? Yeah. So go back to the role of consulfuric acid. What, what did you say it was again? It's an acid catalyst, which we know. That's how it, it can give all that proton transfer, proton exchange thing, right? Yes. And it's not used up, okay? We also know that um, you can also hydrolyze the, the ester in this case because, you know, acid can, can hydrolyze the ester as well. Yeah. But when we do ester hydrolysis conditions, you you never use corn sulfur acid, right? You, you always use a dilute acid. Yeah, dilute. Right? Okay. You can use dilute sulfuric, but never corn, corn sulfuric. Or you can use dilute HCO. No problem at all. Okay. So think about that and the role, the additional role of corn sulfur acid. What else can corn sulfur acid do just now? You say it's a drying agent, dehydrating. So now that you know it's equilibrium, how does how does corn sulfur acid act? acting as a dehydrating agent or being able to act as a dehydrating agent helps you in forming this ester. It removes water from the product side. So equilibrium tends to the right. Yeah, okay. Simply because of the Lee Chatelier principle, right? It's important for you to like invoke this kind of principle, invoke the idea and not just like equilibrium shift to the right. Why? Because you know, when you when you dehydrate the water, the water is gone, concentration of water is gone, equilibrium literally Chatelier says that you know the, the equilibrium will be driven to produce more and more water and therefore driving the reaction to completion. This is the thermodynamic phenomenon. Okay, that's why you use corn sulfur acid, not dilute. Dilute sulfur acid won't be concentrated enough to act as a dehydrating agent. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. Anyway, um you mentioned something about, um, I was going to ask you something. Okay, can you show me your ester? Actually, I'll, I'll show you the ester. So you say it's a methyl ethanoid, right? Yep. Okay. So this is your methyl ethanoid that you, that you produce. Yeah, can you confirm that? Yeah, correct. Okay, cool. If you have, can you see the two oxygen then? Yep. Okay, I'm just going to label the double bonded oxygen as oxygen A and, uh, and the oxygen with two single bond as oxygen B. Happy? Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you tell me where does oxygen B come from? From the alcohol. Okay. What makes you say that? Can you confirm that? I mean, I mean, wh why are you so certain about it? Because the oxygen from the alcohol group was the one which got attached to the carbonyl carbon. And then... Yeah, but why can't, why can't it be the acid that dissociate first, you see? Why can't it be, you know, acid dissociate and then the, the, it become a ethanoid anion that acts as a nucleophile? Why, why can't it be that? Why must it be the other way around? Because ethanoid also has a long pair on the oxygen, right? Yeah. Like, um, so basically my... My question is, why can't it be that that acts as a nuclear file and attack the alcohol? And also, actually, to turn the question around, what kind of, um, what do you know about like uh, historical significance? What, what people have done in order to confirm where does that oxygen actually come from? Do you think you can think about what sort of experiment you can do to confirm where oxygen B come from? How can I, how can I do experiment in order to confirm, you know, like suggest what kind of uh, experiments or what kind of real life experiment people can go into the lab and say like, huh, that must be from alcohol because I can confirm it. How can you confirm it based on what you know or learned from a level so far? Any idea? Not, not yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a there's an area which is quite commonly used ever since the 1950s. It's called isotope label experiment. Have you heard of isotope? Isotope. Yeah. Have you heard of isotope? Yeah. Yeah. You know what isotopes are, right? Yeah. I do. Okay. So in the isotope label experiment, instead of using the 
the mix the mix uh the mix one because i in in reality in nature whatever exists the oxygen that exists in nature it's um it's mostly oxygen 16 yeah. which is why your relative atomic mass is 16.0 whatever okay but it's a is a average is the average of the mass of all the isotopes yeah so in reality oxygen has another isotope it's called oxygen 18 just like you have hydrogen one but you saw had deuterium you have yeah. chlorine 35 but you also have chlorine 37. so so if i tell you isotopes uh what what is different between oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. oxygen 18 is heavier okay why why is it heavier because it has 18 nucleons but then oxygen 16 has only 16 nucleons oh what are nucleons again uh protons or neutrons which are located in the nucleus uh it's not proton or neutron it's protons and neutrons because nucleons are collectively everything that's in the nucleus okay cool so oxygen 18 is heavier than oxygen 16. so if i have a compound if i have a compound that um uh, uh oxygen 16 and then oxygen 18. So can you see this bottom two compound? Can you see the difference? Yeah. Okay. So the carbonyl oxygen is still just just the normal oxygen. I, I did not label it. So so I can do an experiment where I label just one of the oxygen as oxygen 16 or oxygen 18. So these are like um these are like uh oxygen rich, okay they are they are isotope enrich experiment okay so what can you tell me what's the difference between these two compounds then? the bottom one is heavier which means okay it how, travels what, how can you tell it's heavier so just by looking at the formula like that yes you can tell it's heavier but how can you tell in reality in real life it's heavier they travel at different speeds yeah do you see that yeah how do you see that the, he the heavy one travels slower yeah i know but can you can you see them traveling like what what is it that you see or you hold in your hand that makes you say like this is that and this is that uh... <laughs> Any idea? Mm. Any thoughts? <laughs> Using UV? Um, ultraviolet spectroscopy wouldn't matter so much. Plus, like this, you know, ester are colorless liquid, right? UV bits are very good for colored compounds. Yeah, because they absorb, they absorb invisible light. Colorless compound, no use at all. <laughs> Because okay. they appear colorless. Why they appear colorless? Because you know they don't absorb in the visible light region. So uh, unless you're dealing with um, uh, some kind of organic family compounds, this kind of ester they will be colorless because of the okay. backbone is just normal alkyl. Try again. Any thoughts? What other analytical techniques you know? So we talk about analytical technique because you analyze, right? What kind of analysis can you do to show that one is heavier than the other? Mass spectrometry. Exactly. So mass spectrometry will tell you straight away, right? One is heavier than the other. You see, things are not so difficult. Isotope pattern, all that thing you do in the exam, they all have mass spectrum. Where does the mass spectrum come from? It comes from the machine. So that's what you see. That's, that's what you see because that's what you put in the machine and then you can tell you know one is deflected more than the other one is one travel faster than the other one is deflected more than the other because it's lighter and therefore you will see them at um uh, you will see that at lower mass as well yeah happy yeah. okay cool so that's what you can tell in the mass spec all right now the next question is if you if you use if you use methanol so if you use methanol that is ch3 oh where one of the methanol you use is oxygen 16 
And then in another experiment, you use oxygen and the methanol. So these are uh, isotope and rich uh, methanol. Two different yeah. experiments, you don't mix them up. Okay. As for the ethanol acid, I don't bother labeling it. I can, but there's no point of labeling it because uh, isotope label experiments are extremely expensive. Very, very expensive. Okay. okay. It's really true when you think about it. Oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. The relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16.0. So can you think about which which one of the isotope is more abundant? Oxygen 16 or oxygen 18? Oxygen 16. Simply or... because you know the average mass is already 16.0. Very close to it, right? Yeah. Just like carbon. Carbon 12 and carbon 13. Carbon 13 is NMR active. Carbon 12 is not NMR active. Yeah. But the mass of carbon is so carbon 12 is actually abundant in about 99 percent and then carbon 13 is around 1.1 or 1 percent can you see that yeah yeah okay cool so if you start with methanol which is oxygen 16 and then methanol which is oxygen 18 so can you describe can you then explain to me this experiment where you form this um, ester that can confirm that the alcohol actually contribute that oxygen to the ester Go on. Do you, do, you, do you understand the question? Yeah. If, do you want to try explaining to me? Yeah. If the if it was not the alcohol's oxygen, uh -huh. then experiment one, the one with uh, using oxygen 16, uh -huh. and experiment two, the one with oxygen 18, will uh -huh. have the same mass spectrum. Because the Exactly, oxygen, right? Yeah. So, Does that make sense now? Yeah. Uh, and therefore, uh, in light of what you said, so if it is, if, if the oxygen actually come from the alcohol, so what would you see then? Can you, can you show me like the mass spectrum that you expect? Sketch the mass spectrum consisting of the two parent ions. Uh, and I can tell you the oxygen um, in the ester, the single bond, the oxygen, the ether kind of oxygen actually come from the alcohol. Yes, it does come from the alcohol. So if you have, uh, yeah. Like experiment once would have the mass. Actually, overlay them together uh, in the in the same mass spectrum because you know you know you know now that uh, you won't have uh, you won't have them at the same mass, right? So they don't overlap. So I just want to see like um, uh, how would you draw the isotopic ratio? Like just sketch. Very sure. Something like that. Okay, cool. So at least you get the idea that the 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 sixteen will be a lot more abundant than the than the eighteen one, right? Cool. But then obviously, like obviously, like in, in two separate experiments, we get two different products. You don't purposely mix them together, you see. So you will get two different mass spectrum. One of them would ha would have so because if you collect two different mass spectrum, you won't be able to compare their intensity. Yeah. Therefore, you will see very high and also very high because this is 100% oxygen 18, this is 100% oxygen 16. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's... Okay, but in reality, it will be slightly more complicated than that because you have two oxygen, okay? One is a mixture, so you will get the 16 and 18 distribution, but the other one is purely 18. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. Happy? And verification. Cool. So that's a classic experiment, actually, very classic experiment. Um. Let's talk a little bit about, have you heard of carbonyl compound? Yeah. Okay, let's talk specifically about carbonyl compounds, C double bond O, okay? So uh, in general, carbonyl compound is just anything that has C double bond O. Things like amide, carboxylic acid, ketones, aldehydes, um, SL chloride, you name it, all of those. But I think in A levels in general, they just classify all the higher ketones under the carbonyls because yeah. those are classified as the reactive carbonyls. Yeah, reactive carbonyls. 
Can you tell me why C double bond O is uh, in comparison to C double bond C? Why C double bond O is a lot more reactive? In um, what sense? The oxygen polarizes the carbon, which leaves a permanent dipole. And then, so this makes the carbon susceptible to nucleophilic attacks. Yeah, how about C but double then, bond C? Yeah, but then for C double bond C, the large electron density allows it to be to undergo undergo new electrophilic addition because of the high electron density. But then it cannot undergo nucleophilic substitutions because it is not polarized because of the similar electron negativities. So you say alkene cannot undergo nucleophilic substitution. Can alkene undergo nucleophilic addition? Uh, no. It, there's the carbon is not. Mm. It's. No, it has to, the electron density comes from the carbon. So that means it's electron rich, which means it can be attacked by electrophiles. Mm, attack by electrophiles or attack electrophile? Attack by electrophiles. Okay, you need to be careful, yeah? Okay, uh, which one is the donor? Um, so the electrons always come from the one rich in electrons, attacking the one which is electron deficient, right? So electrophiles are electron deficient. When you are, so H plus is an electrophile, do you agree? Yeah, it wants. Okay, so if you have an alkene and a H plus, where does the arrow actually go from? It goes from the alkene to the H plus, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. When you say attack by electrophile, so let's say the electrophile is H plus. So you are saying that attack by H plus. Can H plus attack alkene? No. So can the electrophile attack the alkene? No, it's the. So other... can the electrophile attack the nucleophile? No. It's As a matter of fact, can you, can you ever draw arrow from a H plus to something else? Like curly arrow? Mm, no. It's... Why not? The H plus doesn't even have any electrons. Yeah, exactly. You can't. You can't. You can't have, donate any electrons when you don't even have any to be with, right? Okay. Good. So just be careful with your terminology. Yeah. Anyway, onto the carbon. I actually have a. We love. We love asking people to to uh rank something. Yeah. Okay. Let's rank this. So if you have, if you have an alkene, if you have a carbonyl, sorry, do you see this compound there? Yeah. So it's got a carbonyl and it's got an R on the left, it's got an R dash on the right. Okay, yeah. ready? Okay, yeah. so if you write down, so uh, I want you to rank, um, so let's talk about this first. So number one is going to be uh, a metal and a metal. Okay. So these are in random orders, yeah? Yeah. Um, number two is going to be a metal and a hydrogen. Metal and hydrogen. Yep. Number three is going to be a phenyl and hydrogen. A phenyl and a hydrogen. Okay. Number four is going to be hydrogen and hydrogen. Hydrogen, hydrogen. Number five is going to be phenyl and metal. Phenyl and metal. Yeah. Are you okay with the terminology phenyl and metal? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So do you have five things that are different? Yep. Okay, can you rank them? Can you rank them? So you, you, you can just write pH instead of drawing the benzene ring again. Okay, okay. um, pH or ME is fine. Um, can you rank them in terms of increasing polarity of the molecule? So if you, you know what dipole moment are, right? You talk about yeah. the oxygen being electronegative and it draws the electron density from the carbon, right? Yep. So you will create a dipole moment and therefore you have a permanent dipole. And therefore, 
you know, they attract they attract attack by uh, nuclear file because they become electrophilic at the cover. So by instead of talking about reactivity against nuclear file, it, it it definitely comes down to the the extent of polarity in the molecule. So we know all of this. The polarity is towards the oxygen. The molecule is planar. It's towards the oxygen. Okay, it's trigonal planar at the carbon. It's not planar uh, elsewhere on the alkyl, except for phenol because you know benzene ring is flat. It's planar as well. So uh, I want you to rank them in terms of increasing polarity of the molecule and tell me why. Increasing CH three and CH three would be the most positively polar because of I mean nah wait phenol and hydrogen. CH3 and CH3 would probably be CH3 and CH3 would be at the last. Wait, when you say the last, do you say uh, most polar or least polar? Least um, decreasing polar. So CH3. Okay, CH3. let's let's just say it doesn't it doesn't matter increasing or decreasing. Um, uh, you just use the word most polar or least polar, and then uh, you can rank them for me. CH3 and CH3 would be the least polar because the CH3. Um, pushes electron density towards the carbonyl carbon, so making how, it less. How does it do that? The inductive effect. Okay, what do you know about the inductive effect? What is the inductive effect? Uh. It's. Sorry, just tell me in a nutshell what, what, what do you understand by it? I'm not, I'm not looking for a textbook definition. I'm just looking for like, you use the term, right? But do you know what it or what does it do? It donates electron density towards the carbonyl carbon. The alcohol group. Okay. Why why does it donate towards the carbonyl? Why, why doesn't it take away? My question is why? The oxygen, it's electronegative. Mm, okay. So let me introduce another one for you, okay? Another R and R dash. Let's do a CF3 and CF3. CF. Carbon with three fluorine and carbon with three fluorine. Okay. So that will increase the complexity a lot more. I swear that's the last addition I'll make. So go on, <laughs> tell me, tell me what what do you know now? Fluorine is electronegative, so CF three would be an electron withdrawing group instead. Okay. So. When you say electron withdrawing again, and just now you use electron donating alkyl group, you say inductive effect. So CF three is electron withdrawing. Is it by inductive effect as well, or by some sort some other effect? No, not inductive effect. Really? What is the inductive effect? I'll say no. uh, I will tell you now. <laughs> inductive effect is basically a uh, electronic uh, effect. Okay, so uh, electronic effect because it's due with electrons being being polarized to one side and the other. Okay, when you get a bond, a chemical bond, a chemical covalent bond that is polar, that means you already have a covalent bond. And you have difference in electronegativity, and therefore, and therefore it will be it will be polarized towards one side. Can you draw a CH bond and a CF bond, a carbon hydrogen and a carbon fluorine bond? Okay, one of them is easier than the other. Which one is um, uh, on the CF? Where's the delta plus and where's the delta minus? Carbon delta plus, fluorine delta minus. On the CH bond, what do you think is the delta plus and the delta minus? Where do you think? Carbon delta minus hydrogen delta plus. Do you see that these two are opposing each other in terms of polarity differences? Yeah. 
Okay. Can you see now why when you have CH3 or a third butyl, like a carbon with three alkyl group, the hydrogen is donating the whatever electron it have because it's, it's not very polar bond compared to CF, but somehow it is, it is the electron is still in a covalent bond. It's closer to the carbon. And the more alkyl group you have on a carbon, like tertiary, secondary versus the primary carbocation, you know, it's it's it get more electron donating towards it. And therefore you, you, you call this inductive effect. Inductive effect is a result of electronic uh, effects that are driven by differences in negativity. Okay, there's another effect called uh, delocalization. Delocalization involves your electrons actually moving, moving. It, it hops, it hops from one orbital to the other because they get delocalized. In this inductive effect, electrons are not delocalized. The electrons are still localized. They are localized in a covalent bond. But what is happening is they are polarized. They are not delocalized, but they are polarized due to the differences in electronegativity. So can you see now the CF3 electron? It's also electron withdrawing by inductive effect because you know the color fluorine bond is it's polar. The fluorine pulls electron slightly towards itself compared to the carbon, and therefore leaving the carbon more delta plus. Happy? Yep. Ooh, hang on. Oh, that's a stupid theory. Uh, anyway, cool. So now that you think about this, so you got your termino terminology correct already. Yeah? So inductive effect is not just for electron donating, but it's also for electron withdrawing group like CF3 or CCL3 or whatever. Happy? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can you rank for me in terms of the polarity, like which one is most polar, which one is least polar? The easiest is go for most polar or the least polar first. Because those are the extreme, and then everything else come in between. So, so tell me, which one do you think is the most polar, and which one is the least polar? CH three, CH three is the most polar. Why? Because CH three is an electron donating group, which makes the okay. carbon more less delta less delta positive. Okay. And then where do you see? Okay, and then the least polar. Least polar CFG or CFG because there's Why? two electron withdrawing groups. Uh huh. So, what does that do? It makes the carbon more delta plus, more polarized. Okay. But why, why does it make, why does it make the, if you make the carbon very delta plus, right, you saying? Uh, Okay, I, should, I probably should have thrown the CF3 in there. Um, actually, the CF3 is a tricky one in this in this uh, in this comparison because can you see that in a trigonal planet, you know, like dipoles are vector, right? Yeah. Vector quantity means they have directions. Yeah. So they can be cancelled out. They have magnitude and direction. So the CO is actually pulling it in that direction. Trigonal planner, yeah. Think about trigonal planner. Okay, yeah. and you can draw your vector diagram. You will get an isosceles triangle. Turn isosceles. Isos, isosceles means equal on two sides, right? Yeah? yeah, because the CF3 are pulling on two sides. Yeah. So they will cancel each other out somehow. Um, um, and oh, yes, you're right. That's the least polar because they will cancel each other out. You, you, uh. <laughs> um, Hang on, actually, actually, again, you are not right. <laughs> because can you think about dipoles? And we just mentioned that dipoles are vectors, right? Yeah. So the fact that we talk about like the CO like that, the CO itself can, can make the dipole go towards the CO. Let's say there's the positive direction. But let's say the two CF3 are very strong. Then you will get a net dipole towards, towards the CF3, which yeah. is in the opposite direction. So is that still polar or is that non-polar? If we have a negative dipole. Looks like non-polar. Non so let me reiterate the question. Let's say when let's say when it is um let's say when it is towards the carbon. Let's say when it's towards the carbon, it's positive, okay? 
Yeah. Let's have a direction because like it's very important to have direction. Yeah, okay. Because it's vector. If that is positive, but let me just say that um, if if the CF three are very electron withdrawing, or you have very electron withdrawing group, and then you polarize it in the opposite direction, then you get a negative dipole. My question is, when you get negative dipole, is that polar or is that non-polar? Because dipole can be positive or negative, right? Yeah. So my question is, when you get a negative dipole, which is when it goes the other way, when it goes, because we, we set this to be positive, then the other must be negative. If we set this to be positive, then the other must be negative. You understand in, in maths, you know, positive and negative, right? Yep. So my question is, when it's negative dipole moment, do you think there's polar or non-polar? Non-polar because it's pulling at an angle. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's why you are wrong. The only thing that's non-polar is when it's zero, because they get cancelled out on that dipole. Whether dipole moment is positive or negative, it is still polar, because it's just a matter of which direction the polarity is. It's kind of a trick concept because you are not used to negative value, but you know vectors can be negative, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you happy with negative dipole still mean it's polar? Yeah. Okay. Just it's only when it's zero, it's non-polar because they get cancelled out. Oh, very close to zero, then it's non-polar. But when it has a value and it's negative, it is still polar. It's just polarized in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah? yeah. Think about that CH bond and the CF bond. Okay. If one has a positive dipole, the other one has a negative dipole. Both are still polar, right? The bond is still polar because there's still a difference in electron negativity. Whereas you versus like CC or HH or FF. Uh, yeah. Okay. I know it's a very simple concept, but you know, sometimes you forget to think about this kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So I agree the CF3, CF3 is the, it's a difficult one to do. So I will cross it out. That's probably why this was never in the list to begin with. But I, I, I included it because, um, because to reiterate the fact that electron withdrawing group can be inductively electron withdrawing as well. So inductive effect can be electron donating or electron withdrawing. Okay. So out of the five, which one do you think is the least polar then? So we remove the CF3, CF3 already. Mm. The phenol with hydrogen. Okay. So we have a, so we talk about like alkyl group, right? Methyl, ethyl, those are inductively electron donating. What yeah. do you think the role of the phenyl group is? Because on my paper, my phenyl is just pH, but on your paper that you drew, you drew it as like a benzene ring. Yeah, what do you think the phenyl do to the to the carbonyl um, electron density? The delocalized you... elect de electron in the ring is acts as an electron withdrawing group. So, can you show me? Can you show me why that is? Like you just you say something, right? But do you have a proof for it, or do you have like some sort of reasoning for it? Reasoning for the delocalize. Or oh, whatever you know. I just want to see like what do you think the role of the the role of the phenyl group is like. What can it do to affect the polarity of the molecule and therefore affect its uh, reactivity towards a uh, nucleophile? Okay. So that means since the carbon is double bonded to the oxygen, that means the carbon has a pi, pi bonding. So okay. yeah. that means they can connect with the benzene ring like this. Yeah. Mm, okay, so you drawn the carbonyl carbon and the benzene ring like that. So what makes you, what what enables the benzene to do that? Like I said, why why is this why is this delocalization possible? Is it just because the carbon oxygen is double bonded? Because of the the double bond makes the carbon have a pi bond which can overlap sideways with the pi bond on the benzene carbon yeah but you have a sigma you have a sigma bond right you have a sigma bond to um in between the carbonyl carbon and the phenyl carbon yeah so 
So, but still, how is this overlap possible? Because so. You keep on talking about pi bond, pi bond, pi bond. Yes, you have a pi bond in the ring. You have a pi bond, you know, carbon oxygen. But you also have a sigma bond between the carbon and carbon. And you can yeah. freely rotate around the carbon, carbon, single bond, right? So? Resonance, the electron from the double bond can go to the sing single bond. Okay. Let me check. Okay. So I like the fact that you've you've resorted to that diagram, but like you won't see it unless you, you think about the structure of benzene, which is planar, right? Okay. Okay. Ooh, hang on, just give me a minute. I don't know why my Siri is uh, acting up all of a sudden. Uh, mm, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, it all comes down to shape of molecule. Can you see that each of the carbon? So yes, you have a you have a single bond between the carbon and carbon there. The you know the uh, carbon and the carbon of the uh, carbon. Huh? But yeah, hybridization and the shell molecule. Each of each of these carbon. So they are actually they are actually trigonal planar, right? It's P two hybridized. So all of them, all of them, excepting the alkyl group on the other side. You have a sp2 carbon that can overlap with each other and therefore you know you get that delocalization and you're right it's resonance okay in this sense do you think the phenol is withdrawing the electron or donating the electrons it's withdrawing because why why do you think it's withdrawing the electron from the uh car carbonyl group can enter the ring which makes it less okay First of all, why do you think the electrons on the cup of the carbon? Why do you think that will go into the ring? Why? Why not the other way around? So basically, uh, my question is, my question is, why doesn't the electron from the ring go towards the carbonyl? Rather, you say the carbonyl electrons there is going towards the ring. Why? Or why not? I want you to think about that. Okay. You get the question? Yeah, I do. Okay. So think about what is going on, the electron density and stuff, and then explain to me. Electron. Our time is almost up already, but um, it's very important that you understand the reasoning, and then you okay. can apply it to any situation possible. Okay. So these are very. It's not, it looks simple, but it's not that simple because there are a lot of concepts involved here and it applies to a lot of uh, organic molecules as well. Think about, think about what you said here. So the question really now is, is the phenyl electron donating? So again, this is delocalization by resonance effect or is it electron withdrawing? And why? Oxygen, mm -hmm. technically oxygen is more electronegative. Yeah. But then on the other hand, the benzene has a ring current. Yeah, it has it has a lot of electrons in the high ring, yeah. Okay, so? Mm. I'd say if, if the electrons from the carbonyl group entered the ring is that uh, good or is that bad so you have a ring of electrons then do you want to put more electrons into that yeah i don't think so because okay the, the electrons would just repel from each other yeah that's that's why it's not great right okay in yeah. fact phenoxide phenoxide anion is is it's only like quite unstable as well right because if yeah. phenoxide anion is very stable then phenol will be a very strong uh, will be a very strong acid, but it exists in equilibrium, and it's only driven when you, uh, when you form something else, when you form an ionic salt with like sodium or with with uh, sodium hydroxide. On its own, on its own, it doesn't exist as phenoxide, simply because yes, phenoxide can be slightly stabilized because you can delocalize that negative charge. But who in the world would want to put more negative charge, more electron into elect rich electron density? That's that's electronically 
unfavorable. Yeah. It's going to cost you energy. And that energy is, you know, overcome by forming ionic salt, you know, strong ionic bond. And that can overcome that, uh, that uh, unfavorable interaction. Also, on the other hand, you know, benzene is non-polar. Yeah. yeah. They're all carbon-carbon. So that electron density that is rich is connected by this sp2 framework and yep. and it's connected to another carbon which is has an neighboring oxygen and that oxygen is the only electronegative group there and it likes to withdraw electrons oxygen is a lot more electronegative than carbon yeah. and therefore it withdraws electron density from the ring and the ring is able to donate a lot better than the normal alkyl group simply because of this overlap that you have drawn because it doesn't withdraw, it doesn't withdraw uh, electron density from the ring just by inductive effect. It withdraws it by delocalization, by resonance. Because you can you can get the electron pumping from the ring into the carbonyl easily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in this sense, the phenol is actually electron donating by resonance, and it's electron donating uh, by resonance, and it's a much stronger effect than inductive effect because you know the electrons are delocalized now. It's a donor than the just inductive effect differences in electronegativity right so now tell me compared to like when both are hydrogen and hydrogen on both sides what can hydrogen do which one is more electronegative carbon or hydrogen carbon is more electronegative okay so hydrogen would kind of donate the electrons towards carbon right yeah so imagine when you have a hydrogen and hydrogen Versus when you have a, let's say, simple inductive electron donating group, like metal and metal. Yeah. So which one donates better, hydrogen or metal? Metal. Because, because of... there are more electrons on the carbon than the hydrogen, right? So the yeah. metal group are better donated than the hydrogen. So the hydrogen itself doesn't donate that much because there's only, there's only the bonding electrons. Yeah? So do you want to revise your idea about which one is the most polar and which one is the least polar based on what we just discussed then? Yeah. So that means... There's metal and metal, but then phenol and metal. Phenol would be a stronger mm -hmm. electron donating group than the metal group. Okay, by resonance effect. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And therefore, the phenol with the phenol with the metal would be the most polar. That's correct. You got one. You want to tell me what has the least polar before you move on to things in between? All of them are electron donating groups. So that means hydrogen and hydrogen must be the least one. Yeah, okay. Okay, because you know it can't act as much of a donor, essentially. Yeah, okay. Now in between. Number four. Would you say number four second, is the second, second most polar? There, I mean. Yeah, okay. Um should be the two metal groups. Okay. I mean Why? The, yeah, yeah. Because the rest has, um, we already used the one with phenol and metal and hydrogen, hydrogen and okay. hydrogen. Okay, but when you say uh, the two metal group versus the phenol, even though it's got one hydrogen, but remember about how the phenol group can donate electron by resonance effect, and then you have two metal group that can donate by inductive effect. When you have resonance delocalization effect, it's always like, on average, it's like ten thousand times stronger than inductive effect. Inductive uh, effect is a localized effect. It's just where it is. Resonance of delocalization, it's spread throughout. It's a much stronger effect. Okay. Resonance always wins. Resonance stabilization is a lot better. Resonance electron donation is a lot better. Yes, you got just one hydrogen there, but because you got that phenol there, you can donate the electron density into into the carbonyl, and therefore, and therefore the phenol, the hydrogen is actually more polar compared with the metal and the metal. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But then obviously when you have metal and metal and metal and hydrogen, then you're comparing inductive effect. Two time two time alkyl group which are electron donating by inductive effect are better than just one. Yeah. yeah? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um I just have one final ranking exercise. It's also to do with this. Yeah okay. So if you have a ketone like that, so now the R group is the R and the R dash. So they are just three things. Um, one is a phenol group and a hydrogen. Okay. A phenol and a hydrogen. Phenol. So you know what a phenol is, right? Yeah. And then the other one is uh, 
draw a phenol for both of them. So we have got all that form. Can you see all that form? So there's the phenol there, phenol and hydrogen. And then this is a CF3. Okay. So it's a para, it's a para position. So basically it's like this is bonded to the carbonyl. This is a CF3. Okay. And a H. You get it? The two different R group. And then the other one is a phenol. And then this is bonded to the carbonyl. This is a OME. Uh, oxygen bonded to a CH3. Okay. And then the other one is a NO2, a nitro. Nitro group. Okay. These are all auto uh, para position number four relative to the group that bond, uh, that form the bond to the carbonyl. All of them have a H on the other side. Yeah. Okay. okay. The question is not polarity. The question is which one would rank in terms of the rate of reaction with nuclear rate of, uh, rate of reaction which of one in, in yeah which one will react the fastest with a nuclear file and which one will react the slowest with a nuclear file and why or how uh, okay let's see cf so these are so you know you know these are the two r group Basically, again, so it's like that again. Yeah, but so in the one, one, yeah, one of them, one, one side is just H, and then the others, they, they all have a phenol group, but different kind of phenol group. Sorry, not yeah. just phenol group. They all have around group. They all have aromatic group, but there are differences on the aromatic ring. So I'll tell you, these are all very reactive. Okay, because we talk about the phenol rings can delocalize electron into it. Yeah, ten thousand times stronger than in the well, world. probably not ten thousand times stronger, but you know, a lot more reactive. Yeah. So your job now is um uh, yeah of these four things that has aromatic ring bonded to the carbonyl, which one will react the fastest with a nuclear file? Which one will react the slowest? Uh okay. CFG is an electron withdrawing group. Uh, the nitro group is... The nitro group... Definition. Five minutes. CFG electron withdrawing, so it deactivates the ring. The nitro group is... We're not talking about electron flex substitution, therefore we are not going to talk about the activating of the ring. Yes, you are right, it's electron withdrawing, okay. but so is NO2. Electron withdrawing, electron withdrawing. Yes, you get the right idea. But then again, when you think about electronics, there are two things you need to think about. Okay? The electronics yeah. withdrawing effect can be inductive or can be resonance-based. Okay. And NO2's one is resonance-based. And yeah, do you know how a uh, NO2 look like? And double bond or single bond or? Do you mind drawing me and then we can compare notes? Yeah. Uh, you're missing something. <laughs> you're missing something on your diagram. Do you know what you're missing? Yes, the nitrogen there has a plus, yes. <laughs> what uh, are you missing? What am I missing? Uh, ah, uh, yes. <laughs> is it? Yeah, that's right. Okay, the oxygen is single bond there. Therefore, you see the the whole thing is balanced out, right? Okay, uh, yeah, cool. Right, yeah. right. So it is. It actually get delocalized. So it is sp three hybrid. Sorry, sp two hybridized at the nitrogen again. Can you see that the nitrogen is trigonal planar, and therefore it has that yeah. very nice plan where the electron density you know can get delocalized around as well. Yeah, compared yeah. with CF3, CF3 is tetrahedral at the carbon, so it's 109, right? Yes, yeah. the fluorine is very polar, but it's only electron withdrawing by inductive effect. The NO2 is electron withdrawing by resonance effect because it's planar at that nitrogen. And as you as you draw the structure, you can see that it's a nitrogen sp2, 120 degree, the same with all the carbon sp2, right? 
how about that? So electron withdrawing, electron withdrawing versus MEO. Do you think the OMB is electron donating or electron withdrawing group? Oxygen is electronegative and the oxygen is directly connected to the carbon in the phenyl group. So it should be have you seen have you seen this kind of MEO group in your aromatic chemistry in that? Yeah. Do you know do you know anything whether okay, let's talk about activating or deactivating effect when you do the substitution, right? Have you have you ever learned whether the MEO is activating or deactivating kind of group? No, no. It's not really in the syllabus, right? I don't think so. Okay. Yes, despite what you might think, this kind of group called the uh, uh, I forgot exactly the family is called, but it's like ether group when you have an alkyl oxygen and that. Yeah. The oxygen has a lone pair, and yes, the oxygen is electronegative. But this long pair likes to delocalize itself into the ring. And in a way, it's electron donating actually, it's not electron withdrawing. It's like, it's like halogen. You know, halogens are electron withdrawal by inductive effect because they are of the electronegativity difference. Yeah. But in reality, you know which, which position uh, on the aromatic ring does halogen direct the electrophilic substitution to? Oh, yeah, it's the exception that. Or yeah, but why is it the exception? Why is it the exception? Because the... because electron donating effect into the ring by resonance is always much, much stronger than the electron withdrawing effect by the inductive effect. And when yeah. you can donate the electron into the ring, you activate the ring by resonance, whereas you also deactivate by inductive. But resonance always wins over inductive. Yeah. Are you happy with that idea? Yeah. Okay. In this case, the OMB is actually electron donating by resonance. Okay. And resonance always wins despite what you say about the electron negativity. Happy? Yep. And it's, it's the same idea. The lone pair is it's a small atom. The, the first row can do that much better. Like fluorine can do that better. Chlorine can do that better. It's less well for bromine. Because you know the lone pair are the lone pair are further away from the nucleus. It's less likely to overlap because it's so much bigger. So yeah. now tell me, tell me which one is the most reactive with nuclear farm? Let's see. The the OME one. Okay. Yeah. Which one is the least reactive? The least reactive. CFG and the N2O1, it's a much more stronger electron of joint group, which so, means it can polarize the carbon more than the CFG one. So, so which one is the least reactive again? The CF3 or NO2? Uh, CFG. Carbon is, the carbonyl carbon is the least polarized. Mm, the CF3 is at least polarized. Okay, my actual thing, I agree with you, the MEO is the is the most reactive, is donating, right? By, by effect. MEO is the number one. The final, just the final group is always number two because it doesn't have any electron withdrawing group. So this is okay. the, the standard, right? Okay. So so number two, uh number two after the OMB. So now we are left with the CF3 and the NO2. In terms of the NO2, yes, hang on. We are talking about reactivity towards nuclear file. So the most reactive one would be where the carbon is most delta plus, and therefore the one where you can where you can um, withdraw electron density uh, from the carbon as much as you can, right? Okay. Yeah. And yes, when the NO2 can withdraw electron density towards itself by resonance, and the oxygen is also pulling electron density towards itself by resonance. So can you see that makes the carbon more delta plus than just CF3? Yeah. So actually the NO2 is the most polar because you know you're pulling on one side and you're pulling on the other side. And and well, actually that's difficult. 
I had the CF3. The CF3 has the complexity, but the N2O1 will be the, the slowest, actually. The N2O1 will be the slowest. Why is it the slowest? Because it cancels out the polarity a little bit on the carbon now. Let me just draw this one up. When you have that, so your polarity, you want it to be polarized that way so that you know it attacks the carbon up. But this thing is very good at withdrawing electron density as well. So it pulls yeah. slightly that way. Yes, it's not exactly 180 degree like that, but again, it will pull pull quite strongly compared to CF3 because CF3 is just electron withdrawing by inductive. This one yep. pulls and this one goes that way. You cancel the polarity towards the carbon out that way and therefore you reduce the, 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 the dipole moment of this whole thing and you make the carbon there less, uh, uh, how do I say this, uh, less susceptible to nucleophilic attack. Yes, this one will withdraw, this one will withdraw, but Hang on, what have I got here? Actually, I was wrong. That is the most reactive. Because you would you would you would essentially withdraw from two sides, right? Yeah. And even though the dipole will get cancelled out, but the so delta plus file a lot. Did you get that? Yeah. Oh sorry, I ended up confusing myself. Uh, I hate these trends actually. <laughs> uh, she was a CF3. The OME and the NO2 itself, the comparison is quite obvious. They are they're on opposing side. So you will almost never get them wrong. So the only reason to get them wrong is when you don't know the, the OME is actually donating. Yeah. Okay? And when you donate electron density towards the carbonyl carbon, you make it less delta plus. When you make it less delta plus, therefore, the in terms of uh, electrostatic, the nucleophile is less likely to attack it because it's less delta plus. Okay, sorry that was confusing. You can review this video anytime you want. Yeah. But I hope I hope you get the idea today. Yeah? Today is all yeah. about organic chem. We started with talking about your esterification, and then there's also uh, some classic thing that you should think about, you know, isotope level experiment. There is a classic which you can find out from um, from reading the Peter Waters book, which I thought you have read a little bit already. Uh, but definitely before interview, you have to try and educate yourself with this thing. Yeah? They are not new techniques. They are things you know from a level like mass spec. Okay? <laughs> but unless you read, you won't educate yourself with these things. Um, and then we also talk about carbon house, uh, one of the most favorite hot topic of all. And um, uh, the two most important idea is inductive effect can be electron withdrawing or electron donating. The second one is the resonance or electron delocalization. Those are much, much uh, stronger uh, effects, stronger electronic effects than just uh, the simple uh, electron negativity difference which give rise to the inductive effect. Okay? Yeah. And nucleophiles attack electrophiles. Electrophiles are attacked by nucleophiles, not attacked by electrophiles. Electrophiles can't attack nucleophiles. Yeah? Based yeah. on what you know. You said the analogy yourself, the rich attacks the poor, the nucleophile attacks the electrophile because you are a giver, you are not a taker. When you draw the arrow, it's one way from the other, never the other way around. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. We'll probably have to leave it there. Uh, I need to go and do something. I think Ellen has a session with me this evening as well. I yeah. uh, hope that was useful. Um, uh, I think you've done enough work for this week. Uh, there, there'll probably be... Uh, yeah, we'll do physical next time we meet, which is uh, more physics, if that's all right. Cool? Yeah. All right, are you okay with physics? Yeah. All right, I will do some physics uh, and on-the-spot kind of integration and differentiation as well with some problem next week. All right, we got problems, just send me a text and you should really get started with your personal statement, yeah? It's yeah. not too long to go. Everything should be finalized um, essentially before school starts. And then, you know, it's just a matter of doing your cast and um, a few rounds of your personal statement. Happy? Yep. Okay, cool. Any questions? Uh, no, not really. If I got any questions, just uh, send me a text or something. I'll try to reply. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's all. There. All right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Oops. Let's finish the call.